All right, let's go ahead and get the show on the road. Um, let's start our, is everybody ready? Welcome everyone, thanks for coming out on a warm night. Uh, let's get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, roll call will show that the entire council is present. Um, we need a vote, a uh, motion to approve the agenda and affidavit of posting. So moved. Second. Uh, motion Winesoft, second Bragman. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, it passes. Um, our closed session action was uh, simply a discussion. There was no direction given. Um, I will now read our meeting protocol. Uh, the mayor shall maintain order at the meetings in accordance with Robert's rules of order and the council has a responsibility to be a model of respectful behavior in order to encourage community participation and citizen input at council meetings. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff, or members of the public and to maintain standards of tolerance and civility. Town Council will review the agenda at 10 p.m. to ascertain which items will be heard that evening and which, if any, will be continued to another meeting. Any matter that is not started by 11.30 p.m. will be continued to an adjourned or regular council meeting unless the council votes to suspend this rule. Uh, please take this opportunity right now to turn off um, all cell phones or place them in silent mode. Um, we have a, a number of announcements today. Uh, we have one uh, very special announcement. Um, today is the two-year anniversary of our chief, <laughs> Chris Morin, being our chief of police. So thank you, Chris. <laughs> I, I, I snuck you up on that one, didn't I? <laughs> um, uh, this is the first Fairfax Council meeting that will be filmed by the Community Media Center of Marin, but not broadcast. Future meetings will be available through cable casting and or web streaming, and we have a representative from the Community Media Center of Marin who would like to make a brief statement, so I'm going to have him do that at this time. Please state your name for us. Hello, my name is Scott Calhoun. I am the studio and government facilitator at uh, Marin TV otherwise known as the Community Media Center of Marin County. And first of all, we'd like to thank the council for this opportunity to uh, bring this forum into a video documentation uh, area. And also, we think it'll be useful for other uses um, as appropriate that might be in this space. Tonight's just kind of a test run. We've done the installation. We're just making sure everything's working. Um, setting up our shots and configuring the different connections. Um, pending some of that configuration, we'll eventually be able to uh, cable cast or broadcast uh, to the county these meetings live on TV, which will be uh, interesting. And tonight, actually, we are streaming to the internet on a private link. And after some evaluation from us and the council, um, we can eventually make that link public as well. Uh, for the installation itself, we try to be as respectful as possible about the building. Um, we did have to do an exposed cable uh, raceway, but we painted the parts that were on the wood and we painted the parts that were on the white, so to kind of disguise it as much as possible. And actually, there's some unused raceway over there, which the only reason we installed it on the right side was to keep it symmetrical with the actual raceway on the left. So hopefully you guys like that. Um, uh, some other concerns, we just want to add that w unless there is a Marin TV staff person here on site operating the equipment, the cameras are not functioning, recording video or attached to any kind of video monitoring equipment in any way. So there may be a little light on or something, but that's basically just keeping the settings that we've put in. So, so it's, it's, it's totally nothing to be concerned about. Unless there's someone there, they're basically dead. So that's basically it. And hopefully I haven't gone over my allotment. You did fine. Thank you very much. We're excited. 
<laughs> we dressed up just for the occasion. <laughs> Okay, other announcements. Uh, Fairfax Food Pantry, Saturdays from 9 to 11, Fairfax Community Church at 2398 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. Volunteers are always needed. Um, one vacancy is on the Open Space Committee to complete an unexpired term to June 30th, 2014. There is a vacancy on the Fairfax Youth Commission for any Ross Valley youth between the age of 14 and 19. There's a vacancy for a youth commissioner to serve on the Park and Rec's Commission for a two-year term. And we also want to keep people up to date on uh, the FEMA map adjustments. Um, another public meeting will be held in October. The date on that is not set yet, um, but that will be regarding insurance implications of the revised map. Uh, we want to make sure people know about the Streets for People event on Sunday, August 26th from noon to 4. Uh, Bellinas Road between Broadway and uh, Elsie will be, not Elsie, Bank, Elsie? Elsie, uh, will be closed uh, during that event, um, and we're going to sort of test test out what that street closure looks like. Uh, there is a town picnic scheduled for Sunday, September 16th from noon to 5 on Contrati Field. Any other announcements that I'm missing? Okay. Uh, this is open time for public expression. A uh, three-minute time limit per person. If you wish to address the council, please speak. Please approach the podium and state your name and address. Individuals have three minutes to speak, five minutes if you're representing a group. This is the time that is set aside for individuals wishing to address the council on any items that are not on the agenda. Uh, yes. State law provides that the council is not permitted to take action and strictly limits the right of the council to discuss discuss any unagendized items unless it can be demonstrated to be an emergency nature and need to take immediate action after the posting of the agenda. Cindy? Hi, I'm Cindy Ross. And um, I have three brief things I wanted to address with the council. Um, one is, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to stay for the entire meeting, but I just really wanted to thank you, especially in honor and memory of Stan Shreveman, who passed away a few years ago. I'm so happy to see on the agenda that you folks are taking the Brown Act seriously, even though our state is kind of messing with it. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, number two is I, um, I, I wanted to let you know a couple of days ago I almost got hit by a car again trying to walk across the street getting to First Federal Bank and I'm just wondering how I can get the conversation started to look and see if there might be a possibility for a crosswalk there um, or some kind of solutions for that and there are some other areas of the sidewalks where the sidewalks are cracked and broken. I fell a few weeks ago. Um, my mother almost fell out of her motorized scooter. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if I can get that dialogue going. And then number three, um, I, I read in both the patch and the IJ a few days ago that there was some funny tasting water, an algae bloom apparently in the reservoir. And I guess I'm, I was just a little bit concerned because I understand they're putting copper sulfate in the water to treat it, and I haven't had that much time to do that much research, but it sounds like pretty funky stuff. And I guess I'm just wondering, you know, what, what you folks know about that. So, thank you. Thank you. And that might be a really good question for the water board, too, I think, on that one. Is there other public comment? Neighbor, 94 Hillside Fairfax. I have two. I have one comment. I have two comments. Uh, one is I hope that we will use some discretion in finding someone who's going to be manager of our town. Let's hopefully not find somebody that's going to use it as stepping stone. I hope we can find somebody who has the energy to go out and get us funding that was supposed to happen, and I haven't seen that much in the last few years. The other thing I'd like to suggest is, has anyone thought of putting up owl houses around Fairfax? We don't want pesticides used, and we have an owl house in the back, and we have owls back there. We have a vineyard next door, and they're doing a great job of getting the gophers and the rats. It wouldn't take that much to get houses around town, and those owls do a fantastic job with the rats and the gophers. It could get the schools involved, or the scouts, or whatever. The hardest part I would foresee is putting the poles up 
to put the um, houses up. So, I don't know. Thank you. Just Thank an you. Idea. And I know we do. I know there is an there is an owl house. I thought you, at first you said outhouses. Um, <laughs> there, is like, um, there is. I know there is an owl box at Deer Park at the school there. Um, and I know that a Sustainable Fairfax at one point was looking into getting more in town. And the people who do the Owl House program are extremely particular about allowing enough territory per owl, per, per owls. Right, well the owl care people are yeah. really very, very helpful. Yeah, so I, 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 I think it's been looked at, but it's certainly, I know Sustainable Fairfax looked at it once and I can certainly encourage them to look at it again. Thank you. Thank you. Rose, we'll look at both issues, but even more importantly, you've been away from us for a long time. I'm glad to see your health is better, and welcome back to the room. Thank you. Thank you. Valerie Hood, 79 Dominga. On that thing, I, you know, I looked into find, uh, finding out about owl houses for town. The problem is there are too many people using decon, and the owls die when they eat the rodents that have eaten the decon, and that's why they have to make sure, and they have to check, like, every residence, every every building, and I th I'm afraid there's a lot of people poisoning rats, and that is what kills the owls. So that's the issue, actually. Thank you, Valerie. Is there any other public comment at this time? Come on forward. Um, good evening. My name is Doug Gilmore, and I live at 12 Porteous. And I'm here tonight just to bring, um, bring up an issue having to do with Deer Park Villa. Um, I purchased the home six years ago. And um, um, just it seems in the last couple of months, um, the few strands of Christmas tree lights that highlight or punctuate the driveway has transformed into a really bright string of lights and also um, a very bright uh, green and red open sign is now hanging on the Deer Park Villa sign entryway. And the entryway sign is also much brighter so that's one issue, and um, having just remodeled my house, I used to spend time on the deck and it was very quiet, and at night I could just look into a dark forest-like setting and it was wonderful. Not so much the case now, and it seems it's every day or every night. The other issue is the noise factor. Um, I never heard music unless there was an event. Now I hear music when they open. And um, so, Never having dealt with a town council before and wanting to do, you know, take the proper route, um, I just wanted to bring it to mind that there are a lot of lights at Deer Park Villa that weren't there a few months ago, and there's a consistent noise from five o'clock every night, and I've called the police department and they've kindly gone out and just checked on things at midnight, and even with uh, recently installed double pane windows and sliding doors all closed, I'm still hearing the music at night. So if, there's a, if there are things that can be done, um, great. Um, one thought, compromise, I'd be willing to put up a fence and that might help block out some of the, the lights. Um, but the horizon line, if I put even a seven foot fence up, that green and red sign, sort of like a light bullet, will still be there. So um, I don't know if I ask questions at this point, but I don't know what to do, what, what uh, procedures to take. Okay, I'm going to maybe turn you over to Jim, who looks like he's wanting to yep, respond. We're aware. <laughs> we received an email on this. We're on it as far as the lights and the uh, sign is concerned. We're following up on that. As regards to the noise, we have a noise ordinance, and when there's a complaint registered with the police department, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, um, they go out and they do a measurement, and it is at the edge of the residential property. It, it, there's a limit on the decibels. The bad news is if it's not over those, then it's, it's an allowable amount of noise. So unfortunately, when you're used to something quiet for a long time and then there is some noise, it's something that's allowed up to a certain point. So we can check to make sure it's not going over that. And we are following up on the, uh, the lights and the sign for you. And uh, just be aware you're allowed to go to six feet on that back fence, but if you want to go higher, come to me. Okay. <laughs> but, but sir? I, I might say we, we are rather fortunate these days to have our interim town manager, Judy Anderson, who could pretty much talk Oedipus into leaving home. Perhaps we could uh, impose upon you, Judy, to work with the gentleman and, and the Gearingellis to see if we can reach some accommodation. Even though the decibel numbers might not be over the top, the reasonableness of being good neighbors is always helpful. 
Thank you very much for coming. Any other public comment? Push the button on the on the base of the black. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. My name is Grace Siebertson, and I live in Corte Madera. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at the public comment. I'd like to ask, on the topic of the genetically modified organisms, there's a sign right over here. Uh, we'd like to ask if we can move it from the um, consent calendar to the open discussion. Is that possible? Uh, we will we'll certainly consider that as we okay. look at the consent calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Can I leave you some flyers here, sure. some information, so that you can be better informed about yes. this topic? Thank you. Thank you. On the end, yeah. Anybody else for open time? All right, seeing none, I will close open time and move us to council reports and comments. We'll start at the other end today. How about you, Ryan? I have nothing to report. Um, I guess the, um, the main thing was uh, I was assigned to go to the Ross Valley Sanitary District consolidation meetings. Um, Ross Valley Sanitary District, which has been embroiled in a lot of controversy of late, um, actually hired an outside consultant uh, to do a, a consolidation study of the four districts in the Ross Valley, which are Ross Valley Sanitary, Corte Madera, San Rafael, and Central Marin. And so there were a series of meetings, very interesting study that was done, which compared and um, compared and contrasted the infrastructure among the four districts because they're all, they've all got different levels of service, they've all got different age of equipment, and what they do is they, they rank the equipment of each so that they can, if we did do an, a consolidation, they can equalize it. So it's a pretty interesting study. They did an engineering study and financial study and uh, surprisingly enough, uh, given what we know about the Ross Valley Sanitary District, um, they did find that a complete consolidation of all four districts would save money. Um, so that does not talk to things about how do you run an agency like this, which would encompass you know over a hundred thousand people. How do you tax you know the jurisdiction fairly, and so on and so forth. But um, there's been three or four meetings on that, and so it looks like that is going to go to the Ross Valley Sanitary District Board, which is probably a good thing uh, for them to kind of turn the page on where they've been, um, and that you know that may come back to us in some form or another in the next few months. So we'll see, and uh, that's about it. Um, yeah, I went to a <clears throat> few different things. Um, you know, various meetings around town with a fair buck and the bike spine and things like that. We'll hear about that later. Um, one interesting thing that I went to uh, on the town's behalf was a League of Cities meeting where um, ABAG and MTC <clears throat> and, it, you know, were kind of presenting this sustainable community strategy and stuff. And But importantly, you know, I mean, they had planning directors and, and, you know, people from a bunch of different sides of it. And if some people have been following that, it's um, sometimes contentious because there's a lot of um, housing numbers being assigned, the RENA numbers, which is uh, uh, basically a numbers of housing units that are supposed to be added to different places and, you know, adjacent to workplaces and that coordinated with transportation projects. And uh, it very often it leaves uh, cities and towns with some unfunded mandates at, which don't actually necessarily solve the problems that they're trying to deal with. And um, it's, it was interesting because a lot of the conversations behind the scenes between individuals from different jurisdictions were really, um, uh, you know, they were kind of listening and a little bit up in arms and commenting like, well, I don't know how to deal with these requirements and, you know, talking about their own individual things. And a few people brought that up in the group. 
but in general, people kept quiet about it. Uh, they're, uh, maybe the jury's out and people don't really know how to approach the thing, uh, the, the issue. Um, it seems like uh, from the regulation approach of the uh, sustainable communities strategy, it's full steam ahead in a way and you know, disregarding comments. Um, I, th I think that everybody's genuinely trying to do the right thing. It's just the tools are uh, limited. They're unfunded and you know, you can only do so much by requiring people to build a certain number of houses. Um, and it doesn't necessarily bring our greenhouse gases down. It really is, is how those hou that housing and work is, is being used. Um, so I wish it was more conclusive to bring up. Um, let me see, I guess um, that's really the only significant thing. David? Uh, just that, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, as the alternate on the, uh, on the uh, committee looking at um, the sanitary districts, um, hopefully it's moved toward consolidation. I received the draft report, I think the final report's gonna come out shortly. And uh, I can say that there is a movement among the electeds in the Ross Valley to begin to formulate a, a coordinated um, response and an overture uh, to the sanitary district to, after all of these years, begin movement um, toward consolidation. So as soon as that comes, I'll collaborate with you, Larry, and we can bring forward a, uh, a conversation. Back to the council. Must have been vacation month. Um, <laughs> uh, I've attended a couple of Streets for People organizing event, uh, organizing meetings, um, and I also had the um, the honor of uh, going, attending the Green Party National Convention and speaking uh, and saying wonderful things about Fairfax. It's, a, it's sometimes a little known fact here in Fairfax, but our council holds a Green Party majority and it's the only one in the entire country. Um, and while it's a nonpartisan council, uh, amongst the Green Party, people are like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so they asked me to speak at their presidential commission and I went and spoke there completely at my own expense and the expense of the Marin County Green Party. Um, but you can find uh, the speech about wonderful things about Fairfax on, uh, on C-SPAN or YouTube. Um, but yeah, and then enjoyed a couple of lovely weeks in Minnesota. <laughs> so light, light month for the council. Um, town manager report. Okay, thank you, Judy. All right, we are at the consent calendar and we have had a request to move six out. Uh, and I, I would make that motion, Mayor. Okay, we to have re to remove it. Second. Okay, uh, so our, this is a motion to approve the consent calendar. Um, uh, or yes, let's. So we've got a motion and a second to remove that number. Are there any comments on anything else on the consent calendar? Just uh, one question on the um, finance. Sorry about that. On the finance report for the month, on the utility users tax, um, we. Um, actually filed briefs this week. We, re we filed reply briefs for the town of Fairfax uh, with the CPUC. And one of the things that came up is that PG&E is taxing the opt-out fee. So um, I will send you, I've got a PDF of a, a bill where they did that. And among the smart meter activists, it's called tax torsion, which is a blurring of extortion and taxes. It's kind of clever, I thought. But um, it could be, we could be in one of those situations where we're collecting too much money under the utility user's tax. It's not gonna be a lot of money, but I just kind of wanted to bring it to your attention. And if anybody in the audience has opted out uh, here that lives here in Fairfax and you get a bill, I would like to see it to see if they're taxing your opt-out fee because that's something we're going to be wanting to address with the PUC. And okay. that's it on that one. Any other comments from council on the consent calendar? Are there any comments from, other comments from the public on the consent calendar? All right, seeing that, I'll close public comment. Um, we have a motion, Bragman, second read, to approve the consent calendar, removing item number six. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, our consent calendar passes. Um, should we address item six now or move it to down to regular agenda? You know, Mayor, I think there is some folks in the audience that want to speak to that item. And I think 
you know, they're all here, and I think mm -hmm. they want to line up and just make their comments. Okay, let's go ahead and address item number six then as our part of our public hearing. So, if, if anybody wants to make a public comment about uh, item... Do you want to kind of tee yeah, it up and okay. give it an introduction? What, what item <laughs> six is, is it's a resolution by the town council in, in support of Proposition 37, which is the California Right to Know Proposition, which will enable consumers in California to know if the products they buy contain genetically modified organisms. So this is a very, very important uh, consumer rights proposition. Um, and if it passes, it could really lead to some big changes, some good changes for consumers. Um, you know, like smart meters, GMO, GMOs are sort of a tyranny of technology that's been imposed on us without really any democratic oversight. Nobody asks for GMOs, um, and consumers have no choice now. So there's no market choice for a consumer who doesn't want GMOs. So there's really no mechanism to give people the opportunity to not consume GMOs. And we know now uh, from more recent research, which has been published uh, recently, uh, this, this book called Genetic Roulette um, sets out all the studies that some of these genetically modified organisms have allergens. In other words, there's, there's genes put in them that folks uh, are allergic to. And obviously, you know, this is a health concern for consumers, and we know there's environmental impacts of GMOs because of the increase in the use of pesticides associated with GMOs. And the last thing I want to say about it is that the consequences of this technology are not only dire to our health and the environment, but they're dire to our democracy. Because integral to GMOs are privatization of our food system. And it creates sort of an indentured servitude for small farmers to the seed companies. So really, Proposition 37 not only is a consumer rights proposition, it's a farming rights proposition. And I think that's a very important message that the voters of California have to understand and, and hopefully will understand. And so I'll, I'd love to hear from the community. Thanks very much for, um, you know, considering doing this. Um, I think the other night we had a symposium in San Rafael and there were maybe 350 or so people there. It will be on uh, Comcast on Channel 26. Also, there was a great um, interview uh, by Lena Berman on your own health and fitness this last week on Tuesday at 1 o'clock. Um, you, can, you can hear that in an archive if you want to. You just go to your own and health, your own health and fitness.org. And I think Jeffrey Smith outlines the problem really well there. So um, one of the main reasons that I've been working on this so much is that um, I think that when we pass resolutions, when we talk about it, when we have symposiums, we educate people because my experience is that um, most people don't understand biology at all. So the idea of understanding what DNA is, is it's pretty far away from most people's reality. And what, one of the things that I learned the other night that I thought was so horrific is that when they inject, say, a fish gene or a BT gene into the DNA of, of uh, some other, of a plant, they're just, they just stab it in. They don't really know where it's going in the chain. They don't really know what the consequences are. And, but the way they're marking it is using toxic viruses and toxic bacterias. And they're toxic to us, and they're replicating. And they're now finding them replicating in our guts. And they don't know how long it takes to clear um, there was a really good show the other day. Um, they were talking about livestock that's been getting sick from GMO crops and children who have and, and other people. And so they've been telling, when they've taken people off, off of a GMO diet, strictly no GMO at all, people are actually getting better. So they're, they're actually having some really good medical studies now that they can look at. And I don't think most people realize that most of our, most of our meat that we eat 
is eating um, GMO crops. And they're not really sure what happens when you lice or chop up GMO. Um, but they, it's sort of like that Bill Moyer show, I don't know if you ever saw in 60 Minutes where they did a blood sample and they found 60 types of PCBs in his blood and several types of dioxins. And he said to the chemist, so what does that do in my body? And they said, we have no idea. We know that each one of these is toxic enough to kill you, but we have no idea what happens when they mix. And that's what's happening with all this GMO in your gut that's been spliced up. It's maybe the craziest thing we've ever heard. And the other point is about the terminator seeds, which means that your seed is no longer viable. That means Monsanto, DuPont, who at Cargill, you name it, owns, owns it from, from cradle to grave. It's insanity, I think. These people have gone completely crazy, and I commend our council for pointing that out in some way. Thank you, Valerie. Come on up. Hi, my name is Adina Beaumont, and I actually live in San Rafael, and I wanted to commend you for bringing this topic to the public notice, because very few people know about it, and I'm hoping that this will be the start of dissemination, and also that you will encourage, I don't know how, but other councils to get on board with this, because it's absolutely vital that we have the choice to decide if we want GMO or not. I mean, we have the choice to turn on a TV channel, and food is thousands of percent more important than a TV channel, so we've got to get this out, and I'm not quite sure how to do it, but. Uh, thank you for doing this and being on board. And this is the s double fingers. If you can all do this, <laughs> we'll get it through. And Prop 37 will pass. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Neil. Maybe. Push the button one more time. You were you were already on. Oh, there you go. <laughs> hello, I'm Neil Kraus. Uh, I'm a local resident here for many years, and uh, I want to again thank you for uh, bringing this to uh, um, a, an important issue for the town, for uh, for all of us. Um, I'm a, a chiropractor in San Anselmo, and I've talked to many of my patients about this issue of the GMOs, and most of them don't know about GMOs. It's surprising with all of the uh, attention that. Uh, uh, many of us have been inundated with. So I really appreciate that this has come to uh, uh, this level of importance for our town. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of you for making that happen. I hope that uh, it does pass. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, as we've heard, the, the uh, notion of genetically modified organisms being put into our food is uh, terrifying to many of us and, um, and unknown its effect, uh, uh, short term and long term. And, uh, uh, we're right on the cusp of this spreading uh, genetically throughout the world. And most of the world has said, no, we don't want it. Uh, you know, our country is um, trying to uh, force it down the uh, throats, literally, of uh, um, all of us. And um, it really doesn't belong there. Most of the world knows that. I hope that uh, Fairfax is successful in uh, educating uh, not only our own residents, but maybe we can somehow encourage other towns, other uh, uh, within Marin or, or a broader uh, scope to uh, uh, look at this and see how uh, they can make this a, a successful campaign. So anyway, thank you for uh, making this important. Appreciate it. Thanks, Neil. Hello, uh, my name is Grace Sievertson again. Um, I'm working, as are quite a few people in the audience, with coalitions labeled, genetic, labeled GMOs, genetically modified organisms, and also the right to know. So there's quite a few, but a, a lot of other groups that are working together to educate the public about, yes, um, Proposition 37. Um, I wanted to just mention um, the flyers that I left here. One of them is a flyer. It's from the um, GMO Free Marin Education Project. And so Marin is already a GMO free county and this would be a nice linkage to support Proposition 37, yes. And I just want to mention a couple of um, 
things to be aware of in your food that are highly, if they're not organic or labeled non-GMO, corn, cotton, soy, and canola are um, four of the major ones. And if package says natural, that doesn't mean anything. It has to be non-GMO or organic. Um, the other thing is that over 50, 50 other countries in the, in the world, excluding the, excluding the U.S., 50 other countries, including China and uh, some other countries, do have labeled GMOs on their, on their um, packaging of food. So uh, I guess it's time for us to catch up. Um, and I wanted to mention um, also that um, uh, Jeffrey Smith, who wrote Seeds of Deception and also this latest book, Genetic Roulette, in his first book, Seeds of Deception, he, he, he's done lots of studies. He's been studying this for, since the 90s and gone on many. He's on a circuit right now throughout California educating the public. In his first book, he has about 12 different stories, farmers in the different parts of our country who have, whether they be cows, geese, um, rats, or uh, any certain animal pro um, animals, farm animals. Uh, the, the farmers noticed when they would give their animals G GMO food, and then the other side would be non-GMO, they all tended to go toward the non-GMO. So that's almost like um, nature is telling us something. It's like the canary in the mind. So, um, and if Rachel Carson were here, remember Rachel Carson, she wrote Silent Spring. It took 20 years for this country to outlaw DDT. 20 years, and I hope it doesn't take us another 20 years. By then it'll be too late for our children. If she were here today, she would certainly be here at this podium supporting us. And I just want to say one more thing. Um, for your children's health and safety, food safety, please help us spread the word. Tell your friends. Do what they can. Um, the public officials who have now taken a public stand are Barbara Boxer, Jared Huffman, Mark Leno, um, Assemblyman uh, Michael Allen, and also uh, the Democratic Party have taken a yes on Prop 37 and the California Federation Union. So we've got the momentum going, and now we're going to ask Len Woolsey to get on board. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. For thank our you. children. Thank, thank you very much. Cindy? Yeah, I just have a quick question about Prop 37 itself, because I, I have to admit, I have not actually read the full text. So am I understanding, is it just um, as far as labeling, or is, does it go a step further in terms of, you know, saying banning or, or taking any steps toward banning? or Because yeah, I, I guess I'm just wondering how we're dealing with that. I mean, I'm assuming that the, you know, that the good earth is not purchasing any any um, GMO food as well. I, I'm I, I don't know what's going on with you know our, our other market, the Fairfax market, or even places like 7-Eleven or Don's Market or stuff like that. But I'm just wondering, you know, if there's a way to take it a step further in terms of just not having local markets purchasing foods, you know, so that I mean it's one thing to know what we're eating and to have that choice, but if somebody's going into a store and that's the only corn that's available or, or whatever it is, um, you know, I, I would just like to see it go a step further. Thank you. Larry, do Could you want to speak to the it, it's, it's strictly a labeling law, mm -hmm. and, and the philosophy behind it is that if consumers get a choice and are uh, given the information they need to make a choice, that they will be like the geese and the ducks and the cows and migrate towards non-GMO products. So, I mean, that's the idea is to give folks choice. Um, here in Marin, we passed Measure B back in 2004, which um, prohibits the um, growing of GMOs locally. And we were able to do that because it doesn't have an impact on interstate commerce. 
but to do that on a state level, um, you know, it just brings up a whole host of legal issues and that is where these corporations, you know, they, that's where they want to be. They want to take it away from the voters, put it into court, make their intellectual property arguments, and, you know, find that legal crease that'll get them uh, protection. And right now, I know with the uh, ag bill that's in front of the House, uh, there's efforts being made to prohibit state regulations on food labeling. So, you know, they are ceaseless in their efforts to protect their intellectual property and protect their profits. And um, anyway, the, sh the short answer is this is a labeling law and we feel that uh, if, you know, consumers are given clear labels that the market will decide. And I think it'll also give our the, an opportunity for our local merchants to know what they're buying. I mean, I think that that's part of the challenge is that without it, anything being labeled, even our, you know, even Good Earth, I'm guessing, does their due diligence. A lot of other stores don't always, you know, aren't aren't willing to research as far as they are on things. So it'll give it'll give our local markets an opportunity to to make those decisions too. Turn your mic on, back on one. Yeah, ju just one more quick thing, because I mean, I realize this is probably a far longer conversation than, than we have time for right now, but I, I am concerned about cost factors, and I don't mean that, I, I mean, I think this is something we really need to do, but I am concerned about, you know, uh, certain foods being prohibitive, prohibitively expensive, or people, you know, maybe not being as educated consumers because they're concerned about their pocketbook and stuff like that. So I, I feel like there are a lot bigger issues, you know, and I mean, I would love it if everybody could afford to eat safe, healthy food. So. Say something about that. Right now, farmers that are using GMOs are locked into that GMO seed. Uh, and, and that has really taken the place of saving seed where farmers are not in debt, are not in hock to a seed company every year to replace their seed. So there may be a period of adjustment uh, where, you know, it takes a while for the conventional crops to be, to get that acreage to replace, you know, the GMOs that presumably are not going to get purchased by consumers once they know what it is. So there is going to be some transition. But we know from our experience before we had GMOs that our country had the largest agricultural output of corn and soy of any nation on the planet. And it was increasing not by pesticides, but by really developing sustainable practices, which ultimately are far less expensive to our economy and to our health. So, you know, I, I think I think the the uh, the economics of it are there, and it's just it's got to be given a chance to go through. Thanks, okay, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, one last public comment. Come on up. We hit the button on the base of the other on the black one. Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay. My name is Kathy Eagle, and I live in San Jose. Oh, hit the button one more time, sorry. <laughs> there you go. You can just let, you can let go once you click oh, it. There okay. you go. <laughs> My name is Kathy Eagle. I am from San, San Anselmo. I live there. So I just wanted to come in support of labeling for the GMOs and to um, say that I stand with the council and everybody here on um, getting it labeled. So that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, get one more. Hi, Patty. Oh, click it one more time. Once more. Click into the light station. There you go. A oh, light. Okay, I'm Patty Brett. I'm a Fairfax resident. I'm here. I'm a proponent of the labeling campaign to label GMOs. A couple of points I wanted to make was that uh, coming from food and food and beverage industry, I think it would be great to um, get our local restaurants to include that they're serving non-GMO foods, um, sort of as a, a another way of supporting this this campaign. And then about farming is that, um, sort of a point to what Ms. Ross said, is that our country spends much more um, water on making energy than farming. And water is one of the biggest expenses of farming. 
And what's happened with farming is that it's turned into uh, petroleum product-based farming rather than farming toiling the soil with labor and, um, and water. So it, the, the non-GMO um, campaign would take farming sort of back to, to where it should be as opposed to oil byproducts. That's just what I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. Bonnie? Not that you need more people, but I just want to commend you and thank you for bringing this proposal forward. I think it's imperative for all of us to have a choice and see that, you know, even those that want to buy GMO can select GMO products. So it gives us a choice, and I think it's very important that this truth come out and hopefully will evolve from this and people will be educated by it, but mainly, number one, that we're given labeling and information that we can be given a choice. And I thank you for doing this. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. Any other public comment? All right, seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. I'll bring it back to the council. Any uh, comments from council? Uh, Mayor, I would just yes. move approval okay. of the resolution. Second. Uh, we've got motion Bragman, second O'Neill. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, seeing none, it passes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Larry. And I know that we have a lot of activists here in Fairfax who have really made this one move, and a lot of those signatures that got this on the ballot were collected here. So, well, well done, Fairfax. Um, on to the rest of our public hearing. Second reading and adoption of ordinance number 768, ordinance town council of town of Fairfax to set the animal control fees and establish a process to adopt future fees by council resolution. Judy, take it away. Thank you. As you know, at the last meeting, we uh, adopted an urgency ordinance so that the fees could go into effect. These are countywide fees. All the towns and cities have adopted similar ordinance with the same fees. Um, we did something extra with the ordinance, as I mentioned last time, and that is we included language to make it so that we can adopt future fees by resolution so we don't have to go through the ordinance process. But this is the second stage of this ordinance process, the second reading and adoption. So I would recommend that we, um, that you waive further reading and, and um, then do a motion to adopt the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Imagine that a streamlining government process. <laughs> uh, comments from council? I just have a question, sure. Judy. So what we're doing is passing an ordinance which will allow us to, to adjust the fees by resolution? Yeah, we included language in the ordinance so that future, when we adopt it by reference for the Humane Society and right. the county, that we can do it by resolution. Right. That's right. what most of the cities and towns right. do. Instead of going through Instead a of going through a whole process. ordinance process to okay. change. Things. I wasn't here for the first. Uh, oh, session, there you go. So yeah. That's, well, that was, that's the logic behind it. Okay. okay. That makes Thanks. sense. Okay. Thanks a lot. Any other comments from council? Any public comment on this issue? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Uh, do I have a motion to waive further reading and read the title only? Yes. Uh, is that motion? <laughs> motion Winesoft, second? second. Second read. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, uh, we pass the motion to waive. We also need a motion to adopt ordinance number 678, an ordinance town council of town of Fairfax to set animal control fees and establish a process to adopt future fees by council resolution. No motion winds off. Second. Second read. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you for efficiency. Um, item number eight, adoption of resolution 1251, resolution of the town council, town of Fairfax, adopting the 2012, it says 2012, 2012. Budget. I just want to introduce the topic before uh, our finance director takes hold. I just want to acknowledge all of his hard work on this budget and um, how much better it looks, how much easier it is to read. Um, we're delighted with uh, the product. And I just wanted to commend him because he's worked very hard to get to this point. So I'll let him introduce here, here. the budget, okay? Thanks. I shouldn't even try to follow that. You realize that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Judy. <laughs> the check's in the mail. <laughs> um, this is the uh, second reading and hopefully the adoption of the uh, Town of Fairfax Operating and Capital Improvement Budget. At the last meeting that we had, we went through the budget item by 
item as f and answered questions that uh, people had at that time. And we came up with uh, several items that we wanted to look at and do corrections about. I've included those on, our, on the errata sheet uh, and detailed those in the staff report. Uh, basically, this year's uh, budget, uh, under instructions from the previous town manager, we were told that we were going to uh, not, not do increases unless we had to. So this is sort of a, a holding pattern type budget. There's no big projects that we're going out after with this one. Uh, we have included certain new revenues that we've got from the sales taxes and from the uh, recently passed garbage contract. Uh, Basically, those have been incorporated in here, and I've also incorporated uh, some of the new revenues that the police department has negotiated with our new dispatch services uh, with uh, Ross and with the College of Marin, which, uh, for which it's not apparent that we will have any increase in expenses against, against it. So it's, uh, it's a good way to uh, uh, share government costs without having to increase, uh, you know, uh, the uh, a burden from that so it's a, there's an efficiency that kind of flows through this budget that I'm sort of pleased to see um, so uh, basically what I've done in this uh, in in this is tried to uh, uh, set aside some additional reserves for our uh, retirement fund you'll notice that uh, last week we talked about retirement costs even the retirement costs will will be covered by uh, the, the uh, municipal, uh, by, by the pension t override tax that we had. Uh, I'm still putting in here that we're going to transfer $100,000 over to our retirement account in order to uh, have a reserve there for future uh, expenses in the event that uh, the, you know, that we don't have those uh, kind of revenues in the future. Um, this is strictly moving money from the undesignated part of general fund over to a designated part of general fund. So there's no additional expense that's involved with it. It's merely a transfer or a, or a, uh, a setting aside of funds for those kind of future purposes. So we don't have an expense that's going to go against that. I just wanted, I just felt it was better for us if we had some reserve in that, in that area. And uh, so in this year's budget, we have, uh, we have what I would call a slight deficit, okay? We have revenues that are going to be uh, collected in the general funds, and I use a plural f term here because a lot of these funds that we've got are actually uh, designation of fund balance for specific purposes. And in the presentation, uh, I, sh I show that those funds, uh, what, what the change in their, in their cumulative balance is. So we have uh, revenues of six million four hundred thousand this year, against expenses of seven million ninety-two thousand. We have certain transfers that are going to come in and help offset that. But in total, the general funds will are showing a decrease of one hundred and seven thousand dollars. Now I have not gone in and and tried to make that up through transfers from the dry period reserve or anything like that. Um, my opinion is that uh, just, on, just on the savings that we've got off of the town manager by virtue of the fact that we've budgeted that position, but we're not going to have the expense for that for a significant portion of the year, that will make up that 100000 Just as this last year we had a similar type of thing. We had projected a budget shortage of about $230,000. We ended up breaking about even because of increase in, in revenues that we had over what we had expected. We had some ERAF uh, expen uh, revenues that we didn't uh, budget for that uh, helped us out. And we also had salary savings along the way that helped uh, uh, just about balance that also. So the way that our budget is structured here as presented, we're actually going to be showing that any balance that we've got uh, that is short of what the revenues that we've got is coming out of fund balance, but I'm confident that this is not going to end up being uh, that way. And I don't think it's something where we want to actually say that we're not going to fund a town manager position um, a as an example. So what I'd like to do, rather than go through the budget, uh, is 
open it up to the council for areas that you'd like to talk about or get more information on uh, any any adjustments that we've got I do have a minor adjustment before we uh, adopt a, a budget resolution uh, an adjustment that I saw in in carry forward total uh, which I have a dollar amounts for so when we get to that point I'd like to be a, a correct a capital improvement number so that we are adopting a budget that's uh, equal to the detail sheets that I've got in the budget so uh, with that I'd like to give it to the council um, other council members comments Larry I just have a couple questions yeah. um, so the last time I was at a budget hearing there was uh, discussion about the, whether the pension override tax actually was in surplus, which I've, we discovered, I think, it's not. Um, and that's why you're setting aside or you're designating a reserve to cover pension uh, deficit. Right. It, it, it is the uh, policy that I guess uh, uh, per Michael Rock and, uh, the, and he said he, this had been confirmed by the attorney and previous to that point that the override tax includes uh, expenses that we have for the fire department, which is right. designated in here sort of as a contract rather than being specific. It's not, it's not pension that we pay directly right. ourselves to CalPERS, but it is paid. Right. Uh, it is a pension portion of our fire contract. And so I had not included that. It's not, not something okay. that I was aware of in the way that we did uh, present numbers and, okay. and uh, we, we brought that to light in the last hearing. Okay, yeah, okay. And, I, and I'm familiar with, with that right. issue. Okay. And the other thing, um, the other, I've got two other questions. The other thing I wanted to know about was the um, OPEB, which is the post-employment uh, benefits where we were going to make a contribution to that. It's like a trust to cover future medical. So that, That's correct. CERTB, I believe, is the acronym for the trust that we have set up for the post-employment uh, health benefits. And we have in the miscellaneous section, uh, miscellaneous uh, budget is on page uh, 42. Let's see. Is that where I have it? Yes. Uh, on page 42, I have a, a contribution designated here to the OPEB. We had made a contribution in 2010 for $120,000. And in the uh, proposed budget for 2012-13, I have shown 60000 60000 Okay, so that is going forward. Yes. And that, that basically sets up an investment fund to cover in, uh, retiree health, correct? Correct. Uh, my understanding is we have a guaranteed return of about 4% that we're getting on this. And uh, so, you know, it's to our benefit to put money over into that and let it earn that kind of a rate rather than our um, magnificent rate of 0.3% through LAIF. Yeah, well, I've, I've, I've actually heard there's negative interest rates being charged oh, in yeah. some, some other countries. <laughs> so that wait, that's, that's what we can look forward to. And then the last thing is on the dry period fund. Um, are we making contribution into that to increase that, or what was the decision on that? Right. The, de the decision was, uh, as, the, as Michael Rock had, had uh, proposed and uh, gotten uh, a positive feedback from the council on, was the uh, 200 some odd thousand that we had transferred over to cover last year's deficit would be paid back into the dry period fund at about forty thousand dollars per year so that's, that's, that's in this budget too in this budget we are showing in and if you look at page one um, as a summary it shows the dry period fund will be increased by forty thousand dollars okay good good uh, that's all the questions I have thanks okay. a lot John, other count David but too I, I took the opportunity to uh, reach out to uh, one of our more famous uh, gadflies on budget issues. And uh, I said, this is your opportunity over a couple of conversations to come in and uh, express concerns over the budget. And um, obviously, by absence, uh, we can assume assent. But I, every year, turn to our elected town treasurer and, and ask, because I think it's very important as an independent elected official to 
share with us your thoughts of the budget and whether you have comfort with it and um, to help guide us toward uh, our ultimate decision whether to approve or to correct this budget. So when the time is appropriate, I would, I would love to hear. John? Yeah, I, I guess um, especially with the um, news back from CalPERS and stuff, you know, hearing 4% sounds like a really big number because they came back with one instead of seven and a half projected. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we've got some surprises down the road or maybe they won't be surprises, but uh, unfortunate news at any rate. Um, and also going forward, I mean, we don't know when we're going to find our next perfect uh, town manager and things like that. Um, and one of the discussions that has been knocked around somewhat here is public works and things like that. Uh, I know that public works director especially, you know, they tend to bring in a lot more money to the town and so you know, in terms of grants and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, I can only be confident going forward that we can make some positive improvements for the town, but still keep a balanced budget or as close to balance as we can. So, thanks. Ryan, did you? Um, overall, I'm, I'm so pleased. <laughs> I really am. I mean, as someone who um, was paying attention to a lot of these things and trying to find answers in the past years, as my first budget as a council member that I've been able to go through, um, you really made my job very easy. And and it's frustrating that the amount of hours um, our our staff and our council has spent trying to find the truth in the numbers, um, and how many man hours are spent combating the unknown. Um, you've removed that, and and not only a, you know uh, Councilman Weinsoff brings up a great point that the people who who throw stones at us saying hey w these are wrong why doesn't this make sense they have all the right to do that when we can't provide the answers and what you've done for us is provide the answers and not only that by being able to discuss this in an open forum like this over a few months and having nobody show up to challenge the information puts us at a great advantage to not spin our wheels for nothing the next time they do have an issue because we can simply say to them hey where were you you know so if you're watching this was your chance to come say what's going on and i'm really happy that you made it so easy for people to find the answers that they need and give us time back and i think that that's the the, the great lesson from what you've done for us is you've really there's very few things that give you time back, and, and this is one of them. You're going to allow us and the staff to, to, to concentrate on, on, on progress in other areas and not have to try to fight the unknown. So I'm really proud of what you did here, and I'm really grateful for your work. All right, let me, um, I, I just want to, my questions got answered, and I echo all the, all the good things. I know being on the finance committee the last two years has been really helpful to get a better grasp of what the budget is, but I know as I came in as an, a, a, you know, early in my council years, it was like, what is this? So thank you. I think this is helpful not only for the council, but it's really helpful for the public and for the people who serve on our committees and commissions and staff who, who have to track their budgets. So thank you very much for that. Why don't we give Barbara a chance to speak, and then we'll have public comment. Um, Barbara Petty, uh, 272 Forest, Town Treasurer. Um, first of all, I just wanted to reiterate all the positive feedback on the way you've recapped all of the funds. I mean, coming from a nonprofit background and seeing all the funds. Um, before and not being able to see it in the town's budget has been really um, difficult to figure out what's going on and this gives a really clear picture of not only what's going on in the general fund but all the other funds. I mean it's just a really nice clear snapshot um, of our fund balances and what we're, we're budgeting. Um, I think that all the numbers are pretty much the same except for a few tweaks here and there as what we went through um, but with a lot of detail um, back in June. Um, and I think there was some um, direction from the town council putting money in different funds, which is, is um, in here. So, um, and if you look at the expenses, they're really in line with, with what has gone on in the last year or, the, or two years. So I don't see anything in here that 
um, raises any kind of red flag or um, uh, is anything to be concerned with. I feel pretty comfortable with it. And I, Michael and I spoke again today, and he's been very conservative, as they have been in the last year or two, with revenues. So hopefully there will be more revenues and, and fewer expenses, and it will be even better than, than what this budget portrays. So I don't Thank yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for, for your service during this time, too. Other public comment on the budget? Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, seeing none, I'll uh, close our public comment and uh, bring it back to you, Michael, because you wanted to make a, a tweak on it. On the uh, resolution that we have, uh, there, are, there are three elements to that. One is the general fund, the second is the capital improvement projects, and the third is other projects. Um, I didn't include in the capital project total uh, the balance of expenditures for Fund 53, which is $171,000. So therefore, on the resolution, uh, page 2, item 4, says that 1.225711 is hereby appropriated for capital improvement projects programs. I'd like to amend that to 1.396711. That's an increase of $171,000. Will you say that number one more time? 1.396711. Okay, with that change, so I've got a couple of motions here that we need to get through. Correct? I need it. We need a motion to. Well, we've held the. We need, we need a motion to approve. The resolution. Uh, do we have a number for the resolution, or what? Yeah, it's on the agenda. It just didn't get on there. It's 1251. Okay, so we need a motion to approve uh, resolution 1251, adopting the fiscal year 2012-2013 budget. Uh, motion winds off. Second. 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 Bregman. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> all in favor say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Uh, seeing none, our budget carries. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Uh, do, is there another motion? Are you on that or no? That's it. Okay. All right. Well done. Thank you very much. Um, should we go to our regular agenda or take a break? Little break? Little break. Short break. Short break. Little coffee for Ryan. Councilmember Reed. Mayor Reed. I can introduce this topic just because yes, please I wanted do to that. draw attention to the fact that I put the maps up. I don't think anybody's here to really is interested in this item, but <laughs> This is, uh, these are the maps that the group has been working with, and John and Larry sit on this committee so they can explain it to you, but I, uh, Linda Neal helped me. We put these up today thinking people might want to see what's happening in their neighborhood or whatever, so they're there if you want to use them. Thank you. I'll let John or Larry have at it go. I can start out, I mean, especially from here, the maps are gray rectangles, so. Um, <laughs> basically, this, uh, Bike Spine Project is um, an enhancement. It's, it's as a wayfinding way for that lets both uh, kids getting to school as well as motorists and other people in the area know which way to go. And basically, uh, we've been working with David Parisi, who is unfortunately not here tonight, but he's a well-known. Um, bicycle pedestrian traffic engineer. Uh, he's worked with us on various safe routes to school projects and he's very competent, done a lot of work in, around the county and up in Portland and all over the place. He's very much in demand. So we were lucky to have him working with us here and since he knows Fairfax so well, he was overjoyed actually to be working on this project with us. Um, <clears throat> and it does a number of things, uh, there's signage along the length of the spine, um, as well as street markings, which will be green in color and four feet wide, I think, by 10 feet long. And they'll look familiar in that 
um, they have a bicycle with a couple of chevron uh, you know arrows saying which way the traffic goes and it basically says go this way and there's also some um, traffic controls in some areas in the form of stop signs and we've also got some new crosswalks um, set up and um, and Judy is bringing a illustration of this is the signage um, and arrows that tell you which way to go um, it starts out at the Cascade Gates which is an area which collects a number of different neighborhoods, comes down along Bolinas, um, turns here next to Town Hall and the Firehouse, comes along Park Road right in front of the Women's Club, um, goes down as far as Spruce, and then because in, depending on which way you're going, um, west towards the schools or east coming back, um, the sight lines are different so that it is actually quite dangerous to take um, Sequoia western in a westerly direction because of how cars park and the way the road bends and so um, the route goes up along Arroyo Road uh, there's a blind corner there which a stop sign is being added to uh, and then it comes up to scenic and the recommendation is put to put a three-way stop sign at that intersection then it turns left and goes along scenic um, up to Manor Road. It goes along Manor Road down to um, Manor Circle, and then it comes out to Drake and then follows the existing uh, bicycle um, bike lanes along there. Um, at that point, the markings change a little bit, but they'll be in the bike lane, and they'll continue all the way down. Um, there's a, a branch that goes off to Manor School, our elementary school, Cascade Canyon School is along there, and then finally White Hill Middle School is at the terminus of the project. Uh, the project has, um, right now it's got indications for signage going along Shemran, which ends up on Lefty Gomez Field through a, uh, uh, a right of way there, and there's also a uh, sidewalk along Drake. That sidewalk is only five feet wide, and it was connected to by, uh, earlier this summer, by a uh, a granite path that the uh, school district put in along the edge of Lefty Gomez. Uh, David Parisi felt that um, that five foot wide sidewalk was not enough to carry all of that um, traffic, uh, foot traffic and bicycle traffic. And so he recommended signing along Shemran to connect also with a right of way that, uh, I guess it's an easement technically, that um, connects to the edge of Lefty Gomez Field. Um, it, uh, it, it's kind of seen by the people there as, as, as a big step, um, raising awareness, um, and maybe as, you know, down the road, indicating something along Alima Road would also be good, because that's also a bike route, and it's also a way that a lot of kids going to White Hill Middle School uh, use, and so, uh, I mean, kids kind of know about it, but this, primarily for elementary school and kids just getting to know it, you know, it's good to say this is where we've figured out it's safest. I know that when my son was um, just learning how to ride a bike and getting to school that way, uh, I worked a lot with Safe Routes to School and we figured out, you know, the safer routes to go. And, um, and then talking 10 years later with people who basically reinvented the same process, they came up with different answers. And working with those parents and, you know, safe routes to school people and, and, and you know, kind of digesting the new information, the old information, we met with David Parisi and he analyzed the various intersections and the routes to come up with his recommendation on that so that we could get a clear answer because there were the same ongoing discussions between parents of which way is safer and everybody would kind of pick their own way and kind of wandering through uh, the back streets that way. Uh, so we're hoping that the various um, traffic controls and indications, oh, and I, I should say that returning along that route in an easterly way, coming down Manor and then on to Scenic, then it, the 
route turns right and Sequoia and follows Sequoia along and then rejoins the other half of that circle around Arroyo and Sequoia at the end of Park Road here. So um, let me see. I guess that's the route in <laughs> words. Uh, so I probably left out a little bit, but. Who Larry. knows? Maybe it's better for questions, or maybe yeah. Larry, you have more things. You no, I mean just for the public, what little there is here. Good to see you. Um, it's um, it's kind of our way of creating a green lane for bicyclists, a safe way for bicyclists. We don't really have enough right of way to really create separate lanes, which is really the ideal thing for safety and also to eliminate the conflicts between motorists and bikes, which you know has recently become more of an issue. But what this is gonna do, it's, gonna, it's a pretty innovative program because it's gonna use these torch down logos, so it's very bright, and it's gonna get the attention of motorists and bikers you know, immediately. So that's the idea that you know, when, as soon as a motorist is on the route, they're gonna know this is a safe route, this is for students, and they need to kinda slow down and, and keep their eyes open. So that's the premise behind it. Um, there's some of these torch down logos are used on Market Street in San Francisco, so we're kinda trying to catch up a little bit with you know the, the more innovative public works design. So I think that's really interesting and um, you know, make it safer for the kids and, and uh, you know, encourage them to be biking and walking to school. Ultimately, that's, that's our goal. So um, I think you know, it's gonna put us in the forefront as far as you know, safe routes is concerned, which is kind of nice, because uh, you know, we may inspire this to go into other jurisdictions and you know, create green lanes uh, throughout Marin, uh, including from here to San Rafael, which is a, a very difficult uh, passageway for bikes. So we're still working on that one. But uh, this is a beginning. Well, I'm excited. I know this is many, many years in the making. <laughs> a lot of hard work from our council members, and I appreciate that. And um, Can we, for the public sake of the public, where is the funding coming for this project? Where it's coming from is we identified um, a couple different little pools of money at TAM. So this is not coming, this is being funded exclusively through uh, Transportation Authority of Marin, which is funded through the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. So it's kind of this very um, complex little web of transportation money that we were able to identify and I think you know our pleas were heard by the agency and um, you know they set it aside we had a traffic accident here right when this got funded so that was kind of the uh, one of the things we used to convince them that this was a good investment because we'd had a a close to serious accident. Actually, the student was not really seriously injured, but it was a scary situation. So that actually kind of got the ball rolling, and it actually was only about a year ago. So this has been a pretty quick thing. We've had great help from Jim, from everybody on staff. So it's 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 actually evolved pretty quickly for a public project. Yeah, it, it's actually phenomenally fast. I remember it took over 10 years to get the cross road walk put in right. at Oak Tree Lane across Sir Francis Drake. And you know, so this, this is uh, amazing if you're used to the bureaucratic process. And I should probably also add that, yes, this is all money that came from TAM and they do see it as a pilot program. I've been approached by uh, council members from several other cities and towns in Marin. Uh, they're you know, very eager to see how it comes out and what it looks like, and then, of course, they'll want it too. Right. But, um, you know, that's, they've said that. And um, very often these grants come with the requirement of matching funds from the local town, and I'm happy to say this one did not, um, partly because of its pilot nature. Um, but uh, no money from Fairfax aside from the 
salary of our staff who was conferring on it. But uh, basically, we were using consultants for the bulk of the work, and um, that was all paid for with TAM money also. Wonderful. Ryan? Well, I had a thought uh, that hit me uh, when I got back from vacation on something like this because I, I, I can see the maps and I understand I'm kind of a map guy um, and I can get the route, but a lot of people don't read maps well and it's hard to look at it in a, in a, in a form where you get a real good view. And, and an aspect of all the hard work that you guys have all put in on this and our staff, from a marketing standpoint, I got the concept of putting a GoPro camera on a handlebar of a child and riding the entire route and putting that up on our website or putting that up on your marketing aspect because a lot of people are visual learners some people look at maps but some people just you know like that whole being taken on the route and it also is a way for them to show kids how the route works how it looks so once you get it all done you just take a 10 year old or an adult put it on the handlebar or a helmet a helmet may be a great idea because if you put the gopro camera on the helmet when you come to the stop sign you actually look left and then you look right and it, it'll actually give the moment of the whole trip. And when you finish the filming, it's not that the whole film is going to be on a 10-minute ride. It'll be sped up to be about a minute and 20 seconds of, you know, a little of this and then a little of this. Come to a stop, start again, get the route down. It'll, it'll be a nice way to advertise it, market it, and also teach the younger group the, the lessons that and how it's done and I think it would be a great marketing piece for showing other neighborhoods how it would be done. Nice. Yeah, Larry. That's, that's a very sagacious um, recommendation and I, I think we actually discussed that with uh, David Parisi. So um, very, very uh, interesting and I, I do agree it's a lot easier for uh, most of us like me to actually understand it that way rather than by the two-dimensional map, so good one. Well, I think it's also nice that a big part of the route is this route that is used every year the, uh, during the back-to-school ride that the you know all the kids kind of do together, starting at the you know starting at the town hall. So I think that's another opportunity to maybe guide people on that. I know I've been on safe routes rides with my daughter, where they teach you how to ride with your kid and that kind of stuff too. So it might be good to you know, once everything's in place to have a little demo ride or something like that mm -hmm. for people to get used to it either before, uh, when is it gonna be on the road? Uh, I think we might, we might have this thing out for bid September, so maybe build it in October. It's quick, it's gonna be a quick build. But it, it won't be for back to school? Uh, we'll be a quick. little late for <laughs> back to school, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I mean, we're gonna roll it out for comments and things too that, and, and just, informationally also to the back to school things um, you know it will hopefully David will be here next month to present this again uh, he's, he's not we heard available on September 5th but he's he, not he's, I told him we'll get him at some point at a public meeting yeah well I mean I think that would be important um, earlier I had met with the homeowners Association down along Shemaran at the at the western end of this um, at that point, uh, David's final recommendation for that was not out, but uh, White Hill School had just built the new pathway that connected to the sidewalk. And there was a discussion there um, at that meeting where they were saying, well, we're assuming that it's all gonna be going around the neighborhood because that's where the sidewalk is. Um, I did send emails to contact people that I had in that homers, I mean, that was their yearly meeting that they discuss that at so um, I guess as the timing of that worked out I mean I, I think it's important to get comment from them um, I had not heard back from anybody that I emailed about this meeting uh, letting them know that these changes were there um, but that the you know the public comment period is certainly now so uh, I think it's ex exciting new project and I'm hoping we hear positive comments. Any other co comments from council or to, I'll send it to the public. We take the public comment, Cindy. Hi, uh, Cindy Ross again. Um, uh, you know, I, I've, got, I've got a couple of things that, I, that are on my mind about this. Um, just in terms of talking about Shemron Court. Now, I, I haven't been there for a while, but I actually briefly lived on 
Shem Shemron Court when we had the fire at our house a few years ago. Um, and I, I'm just a little bit, I, I guess I'm a little bit unclear on that right now because to me, having, it, it was kind of a disastrous street as far as all of the cars and traffic and, and congestion and stuff like that. I'm just a little bit concerned about if there's a safe path or if that's gonna be built or I, I guess I'm just not understanding what, I can't spit it out. <laughs> I, I'm just wanting to make sure that it really is indeed a safe route going through Shemron Court. Um, and then also, I mean, this to me this sounds great, uh, but at the same time, I, I am wondering, as somebody who lives on the east end of town, we have, I mean, in theory, it sounds good that we have bike lanes and stuff like that, but it is such a disaster right now down in the area around Good Earth, Lansdale Avenue, Center Boulevard. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just really, really concerned about, you know, I mean, this sounds great for a certain part of town, certainly most of the kids, that are going to Manor School and Whitehill, et cetera, live maybe more, you know, downtown and, and west. But I know as somebody that my, my own son went to Manor School and to Whitehill, and except for briefly when we were living on the west end of town, I mean, it, it, it was too unsafe for him to ride a bicycle. Uh, it, it, it really was. I mean, it, it was a nightmare situation. So I, I, I just would love it if at some point there would be something that would address all of Fairfax tying us together. I mean, right now, literally, it, it's funny at times, and I know there's been a lot of stuff in the patch and in the IJ and, and all this stuff, and I feel like, once again, I've become public enemy number one, you know, because of some of the things that I've said, but I'm not exaggerating when I say that my own son, this was a few years ago, but my own son was hit by another cyclist, and I thought I was gonna have a heart attack when I realized that she was a safe routes to school bicycle safety instructor. And she very literally could have killed my kid because she was just completely oblivious and then yelling and swearing at him. Um, anyway, I, I, I know my time's up, but, but I just hope that you'll consider us folks on the east end of town too. Thanks. Thank you. Do you want to address the Shemron Avenue or the Shemron Court? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't. I, I've, I've been in some conversations with David in terms of Shemaran. It it is it is a dead end street that ends at this um, easement that goes through to Lefty Gomez Field, and that easement itself is I think eight feet wide, something like that. Um, and I don't think it is meant to be exclusive at all. And, and that's why the pavement markings are not going there. Um, but I think David, especially as a traffic engineer, didn't feel comfortable indicating that a five foot sidewalk was the only way that pedestrians and bicycles were supposed to go together. And um, you know that the pavement markings lead up to that point. And then there's some signage along Shemran just to you know, make awareness that, that, you know, midway along the block and then at the, um, at the easement. And um, the, the sidewalk basically is, has a bright yellow marker getting onto it. Um, and, you know, uh, having not spoken with David exact, you know, because he is out of town right now and basically we saw these uh, maps submitted to us. Um, you know, I, I talked to him briefly by email about it, where he said, "Well, you know, he he, uh, um, you know, gave the reasons which I said earlier, you know, um, but I couldn't elaborate further on his thinking. I can understand that thinking, you know, and basically, the policy of White Hill School is to try to get all bicycles and pedestrians off of Glen Drive completely." especially because they're under construction at this point. And uh, there's a lot of buses that access White Hill School there, and it's and a lot of passenger cars, and it's really dangerous up there. And uh, so there was a series of meetings um, with the principal of White Hill School, as well as representatives from the neighborhood, and um, 
kind of trying to come up with a viable solution for this. And pretty much this pathway along the side of Lefty Gomez was picked as as the, as the safest alternative. Uh, yeah, I think safety, whenever we're talking about our kids and biking, becomes very relative. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah and I it's, appreciate it, that we're making, we're making I mean, that basically, effort. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, it, it's never, you know, nothing in the world is ever perfectly safe. And so right, safe routes to school is kind of, you know, I, you wonder legally about that name. Um, but basically, you try to do the best job that you can. And, uh, and I know that with the spine, the thought was, you know, I mean, it doesn't go past the Cascade Gates and it doesn't go past this, this junction here, but it does connect to a pedestrian alley right there with a, a back street, which is Dominga, which connects to a bike lane that goes to the east end of Fair, uh, Fairfax. Um, it's not perfect, and we all know that, and it'd be nice to live in a perfect thing, but with limited funding and stuff, this is as good as we could do right now with $110,000, so. Okay, so it's, and this is gonna be on our agenda next yeah, month. Yeah. It, it's, it's, the, it's a start. You know, the West End, you know, there's probably half a million dollars in infrastructure improvements we need to make. I mean, I think it should, traffic coming off White Hill should be controlled. There should be a light. There should be a pedestrian island. But, you know, we're not getting that funding. You know, that money's going elsewhere, and I think we all know where it's going. It's not being invested in our domestic economy. It's, you know, it's being siphoned off into various projects that I, you know, I don't think we want to have that conversation. But this is a start, and, and when we got into it, um, we recognized it as such. But we need to push and we need to prod to get the additional money you know, to make it 100%. So this, you know, this is just a piece of it. And as we discussed, you know, we have a lot of unmet infrastructure needs. And hopefully this is gonna make it more safe until, you know, piece by piece, you know, we complete it. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna uh, close public comment and um, bring it back. I mean, we're kinda, it's a, it, we've, I think we've done our discussion and consideration and it will be back on the agenda for next month. Um, if there's no other comment, I think we'll move on to item number 10. Uh, and this one is yours, David. Great. Uh, Mimi, come on up. Um, this is the second uh, reading and adoption of Ordinance 766. And as we discussed um, back on July 11th, um, I'm uh, the Gunga Din carrying the water from Mimi's uh, excellent idea here. We all know uh, Mimi from her work on the Open Space Committee and uh, even more importantly, her work as an attorney with the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. She came to council and, and, and asked us to um, consider something that certainly flies below the radar of environmental protection, but is exceedingly important as the memo that uh, I carry, but that Mimi has in um, significant measure uh, drafted for us. So I, I, unless the council has particular questions about the importance of this or the approach that we're taking uh, from a regulatory stature, I would ask the council um, to adopt this ordinance. Uh, any discussion from council? Any comment? Mimi, do you want to make any? Yay. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, with that, I would... Can uh, I see if there's any other public comment? Seeing none, I will close public comment and bring it back to you, David. Yeah, I would uh, move that we uh, waive uh, second reading of Ordinance 766 and authorize the introduction by title only. Second. Uh, motion Weinsoff, second O'Neill. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, a uh, motion carries. Uh, the next one, number 11, is No, 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 no. Oh. Now we have to adopt Oh, sure, you're right. Yeah, you go. Sorry. We have to adopt, I make a motion that we adopt Ordinance 766, <laughs> um, an ordinance um, adding 712-170. Um, second. Motion, Winesoft, second, O'Neill. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion carries as Thank well. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you, David. Uh, number 11, item number 11 on our regular agenda is also yours, David. on a number of occasions to apprise the Marin community of the extraordinary amount of government that it takes 
to govern us, uh, a little too over the top. And uh, certainly with a little tongue in cheek, their most recent missive, uh, preschoolers learn to share can local government. Uh, the town drafted uh, and was required to respond to a number of points uh, to the grand, that the grand jury raised. And um, I thought that we could do a better job of more fully responding and respecting the grand jury's efforts in this regard. And so I um, took it upon myself uh, for the council's consideration, uh, but it's, it's item R4 of the report, um, to highlight in two paragraphs. First, uh, the consolidation efforts that we've made on the fire side, bringing in uh, Sleepy Hollow Fire Protection District as a full um, voting member of the JPA, and of course, more recently, the town of Ross, bringing us into sort of a four-part voting uh, JPA. Um, and I, uh, if I had uh, a dream, it would probably swallow up a few other uh, fire departments along the way. Um, and also the uh, extraordinary work of staff and Chief Morin um, to uh, reach out to do dispatch service uh, for the town of Ross and the College of Marin. However, in the second paragraph, I want to note um, that uh, this council at my urging has also addressed what the grand jury refers to as institutional duplication. Um, found in the operation of the Ross Valley Sanitary District. Larry uh, mentioned the consolidation uh, effort that is uh, hopefully underway. Um, we have expressed our communication over their rate increases, and uh, we have recommended uh, that uh, they consolidate uh, in, the, um, in some form, hopefully with the full four member agencies, including uh, CMSA. So with that, I would like to bring to the Council's uh, opportunity to support uh, staff's response in significant measure to the grand jury, but uh, with regard to the recommendation of R4 to adopt uh, the language that I've uh, recommended. Comments from Council? John? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm um, sorry. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, this report is good as far as it goes, I mean, but really we're looking at um, a number of situations where, you know, areas where we have the water district, for instance, also having pipes that aren't so good, and then utility companies that, um, you know, also dig up the street regularly. And it seems like every time something breaks, you know, somebody other or other has to hire a whole crew to dig up a street and then replace whatever it is and then cover it back up again and then repave the street and then what do you know a year later somebody else is uh, getting rich doing that. And it seems like one idea that could be explored um, and of course it would be expensive at the outset which you know you got to come up with the money for that but if there is in a, in a way, like a, a conduit, a, a raceway under the street where basically you could put in a new pipe, you know, switch out another one, and you're not digging up the street every time. You know, I mean, obviously, it's, it's, we have a, a mini version of that with manholes and then pipes connecting to it. But if you had, a, in, in effect, a raceway or a conduit where a number of different pipes could go through and be accessed a lot more easily and inspected um, in the long run, I can only think that that would save some money. That was just an idea, and I know it's not written up in the thing, and perhaps that shouldn't be included, but that's an idea. Okay, I know Larry wanted to go yeah. ahead. I just um, wanted to comment on the language on the Ross Valley Sanitary District. Um, you know, um, the last sentence here says, Ross Valley Sanitary has not consolidated services. Well, it's not for a single agency to consolidate services. Uh, the conclusion of the consultant was that the only consolidation scenario that will save the ratepayers' money is a complete consolidation of four separate utility districts. And the consultant uh, has not made recommendations about how you equalize revenue or governance. And I think to some extent um, the Ross Valley Sanitary District and probably by its own making has become a bit of a scapegoat for the duplication of services among the various sewer agencies. 
it, it's, it was interesting to note, for example, that of all the sewer agencies, which are, there's three, there's Corte Madera, San Rafael, and uh, Ross Valley. Ross Valley actually has the highest level of service. So when they actually did an age rating of the infrastructure, Ross Valley had 60% useful life on its infrastructure compared to 40% for Corte Madera, and I think some similar number in the 40s for San Rafael. So in spite of all its drama and problems, it's actually has been succeeding in putting pipe in the ground and actually delivering service. It has, happens to be the biggest district in terms of mileage of pipes, uh, although not population served, but it literally is, I think, has the biggest geographical area because the north end of San Rafael is Las Galinas Sanitary District. So I think the language should be changed um, or the last sentence should be just knocked out of it that Ross Valley has not consolidated services. It, it, this is going to be a very delicate dance for these four agencies to come together on governance and finance. And um, so I just don't think Ross Valley should be singled out for, you know, the fact that these districts have, haven't consolidated because what we're being told is that in order to equalize the situation financially, San Rafael and Corte Madera are going to have to invest more money, so that rate base is going to have to put more money in so that they get up to the service level that San Rafael, or that Ross Valley Sanitary is actually delivering. So that all being said, I, I think that last sentence really is a little, um, should be excised. I'd be happy to excise it. After all, it is self-evident they haven't consolidated services, because if they had, we wouldn't have written the paragraph. Right, but my, my point is, it, it takes four to tango here. There's four separate agencies. And, you know, there's a lot of little things to be worked out among those agencies, both financial and governance. So I just, I'm, I'm just, I, I think, you know, they're going to have to take a pretty serious look at going forward with it. And I think we should encourage them to, to do that. But um, like I said, it, it's going to take the cooperation and coordination of a lot of different agencies to make that happen. Okay. Uh, Ryan, you had some? Uh, yeah, it, you know, I think all of us have a responsibility to to identify institutional duplication. I think that that's why we're here as leaders of the community is to try to represent the people of our town and our community. I think that's a kind of a no-brainer. Um, and it says here, bring leadership, vision, and openness to new, more cost-effective alternatives. I think that is a lofty goal and one that we should always concentrate on. Um, I'm 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 a little hesitant to back any language at this time based on the recent shakeup that has just occurred in the Ross Valley Sanitary District with the, the manager and the issue with Mr. Richards. Um, there's a lot of hot uh, issues going on with that by itself. Um, they had a new changeover of the personnel there. Um, I, 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 I do support vision and openness to new more cost effective alternatives. I think we would be ignorant not to address those anytime we can. But it's difficult for me to back anything just yet because I haven't seen the new board at work. I haven't seen the information coming back from how it's going to shake out. And, and that's why I'm this is a little hesitant. This is telling the um, grand jury what we have done, not what we will do. We have communicated to them. This is telling, they are saying to us, what have you done to advance this goal which we have set out? And this is telling them, this is what we've done. We've consolidated here, fire, police. Um, and this is what we have addressed with regard to things that are also on our plate because these are our constituents. It is not aspirational. It is responsive or historical. If I may, do, I, I'm, I remember um, addressing the concern over the spiraling rate, the spiraling rate increases. Um, I don't recall um, recommending that it consolidate with Central Marin. Is that something that we did as a body before I was here? Uh, what's his, uh, ge the general manager Richards came, gave a um, expanded explanation of his, uh, um, uh, what, what he was doing with the district and that issue was addressed with him, certainly by me. And when was that? Was that before I was on the council? Oh yes. 
Okay, so that's why. I that, okay. Is there a specific language that you are at requesting well, I, change I, on? I think for me, being the newest uh, member of the council, that uh, of course I, I would have, as anyone would, a concern for the rate increases um, uh, because I think that's a very logical choice. Um, I, I am not prepared to talk about the consolidation without doing more homework and getting up to speed with the rest of you, though. Not recommending. It's responding to what we've already done. That's, that's what this is about. Mike, I, I don't know that the council, whether our resolution recommended consolidation or not. So, you know, if we're really going to talk about whether if, if it's historical or reflecting our action, I don't recall whether we did it's that not or saying not. that we did that it's saying that we communicated to the district its concern over rate increases and recommended that yeah you know, here it is saying that yeah it's right it's recommending but, that we consolidate but it says it. and has recommended that it right and I don't know whether we've done that or not I, I think it was much part of a much bigger conversation where you know it, it's it there's a lot of apples and oranges there I mean there's different pension obligations there there's different condition of pipes and I remember talking about that so, so can we um, can we but it's, moder can we modify the language to say that we have asked them to look at consolidating services because we've certainly done that. We haven't necessarily recommended that it does consolidate, but we have certainly recommended well, that it that say, it study consolidation. Which, is that which language done, that feels yeah, which, exactly? They, they've done it, and at, which they have done, and you know maybe we just say recommended that it consider consol consolidating sanitary services with Central Marin. I mean. I don't think at this point, you know, given how the changes that they're going through, you know, and the new board, I mean, there's, there's, a, I think, a growing consensus over there that they've, they've got to do something to reach out to the ratepayers. I mean, the one thing the, the consultant said is there's, there's, there are many millions of dollars of unmet infrastructure need. I mean, the district's 100 years old. There's wooden pipe in the ground. So, you know, the problem really has been that they haven't gotten, been able to communicate effectively to the ratepayers in a way that gets, builds a consensus towards, towards doing it. But, you know, it was very much um, demonstrated that there is a real need, you know. And so I, I guess, you know, I think... A little gentle reminder is, is would be effective here because okay, so let me change the language to say and, and has recommended that it um, consider consolidation of sanitary blah, 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 to the end of that sentence and uh, strike RVSD. Right. Okay. Perfect. Right. That'd be great. Is there so John, you had made a point about uh, tearing up the street. Is there is there language you want to add on that? It's I mean it's kind of outside of our. It's outside of this. It seems out, I mean, we're responding okay. to their report, and I think right. it's outside of that. But since, you know, it's a public, uh, you know, gotcha. it's a publicly recorded situation, I, I think it's certainly worth noting. I think that's a, it would be interesting to see what that would look like, uh, gotcha. but it's outside of this. Okay. Other comments from council? Any other language that, okay, no. any uh, public comment? Seeing none, I will close public comment and ask for a motion uh, to approve with those changes. So moved. Motion Weinsoff. Second. Second Bragman. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Thanks, David, for working sure. on that. Uh, Ryan, let's give a update on number 12 here for FEMA. Uh, Again, this is uh, in regard to the uh, FEMA flood map updating meeting and the impact it's going to have on the property owners of, uh, of our town and our area. And again, the, the, like the budget and having it on the agenda every month is very important so that we can actually show that we're really trying to reach out to these people. Um, uh, I was on vacation, but Judy put together this report for me. But again, it's it's nothing new that we haven't talked about, but it is very important. I think that we have a very brief discussion as many times as possible. Um, I did uh, talk to Mark Lockerbie um, the, uh, this morning in regard to the next, um, the next steps. So briefly, um, that the FEMA officials conducted uh, a meeting at, at uh, Drake High School June 28th um, about the new flood maps of the Ross Valley. 
Um, the new flood maps designate floodways um, that the highest hazard zones, including areas that have 1% chance of flooding each year. There was a lot of pushback in the meeting. Um, again, I don't want to repeat anything that's gone over, but the fact that this will be televised may help reach out to people, so I don't want to skip some things. Um, but the maps that were presented on June 28th were working versions of the preliminary maps, and people who wanted to challenge the maps had the ability to do so. Um, but people that are in these flood zones, A, probably don't know about it yet, um, and B, will dramatically be affected with costs of insurance and mandatory insurance um, unless you outright own your home. I think any federally fact, and, and, excuse me, any federally backed loan may have to have uh, this insurance. Um, and a lot of uh, homeowners have said, hey, I'm in this map, but I haven't flooded ever. I've been here 30 years. Why am I doing this? So uh, in, an, in an attempt to really make sure we reach out to the people to let them know, um, I, I, in speaking with Mark today, uh, that there is no date for the main meeting um, that, to, that this information will come out, but, there, but when it does come out, there will be a morning session um, to um, deal with insurance and real estate issues, and then uh, the afternoon for residents and the evening for residents uh, will also cover uh, focusing more on the insurance aspects. Um, there will be a mailer and a walking piece. The mailer will go out from the town, and the walking piece that we talked about, uh, we need to get um, out one week before the actual meeting, and the approximate date of that meeting is going to be in October um, sometime. With the final changes taking effect, where people have to have this work done by approximately October 2013. So again, um, I, I, I asked for support of the council in, in walking uh, the precinct uh, that's most affected. Um, uh, I think it's really crucial that the people who um, are most affected of this, A, get the mailer, but B, get it walked. And, and they'll see these two uh, pieces that will come to them and they will get involved. And, and the premise being is that I would just hate to see somebody come in here and say, I didn't know. And the reason for walking would really to show them that, hey, we're really trying to get the message out there and try to help you because once uh, these new flood maps come into place, they're really going to be dealt a hand that they have to deal with, and at least we can um, provide them the opportunities to um, help out the, the concepts and also for the planning to be aware that they may get a, f an, a flood of applications and, and our job to work as best as possible with these people to streamline within our guidelines um, to help them help themselves so that they can feel as though that they were included and not just bound by the issues. And if people want to protest their um, their location on the map or their designation on the map, what is the route that they should take for that? And that's that's unclear for me at this stage. Um, but all this will be outlined for them um, through the appropriate channels. So that's what those meetings are for. So that when they when this meeting comes down, that everybody gets to go find out the ways and the avenues that they need to take. I think it would be a great idea uh, for the website. Uh, from the town to say, you know, really streamline. If if you want to contest this, click this link, do this, do this, do this. Do everything we can to signpost the avenues for people. Give them the resources that, I mean, we, we don't have the manpower to call on behalf of any one person, but if we can show them the roadmap of how they do it, um, I think that's as far as we can go. Reach out for the out the outreach uh, to tell them what's going on, and B provide them the resources to find their own questions. And then at least um, I think we, as a council and a community with good conscience, said we did everything we could to try to help out for what we don't have control over. Good, and I think you've, we've certainly given you support that we'll help. We'll help you. We'll help you walk. Larry, did you have? Yeah, yeah. just on uh, what what they can do. So they can be in a flood zone, and the flood zone just crosses. A corner of their property and then they get hit for the insurance and it turns out well the house is a, is at a higher elevation so what they need to do is if they get stuck in the flood zone unfairly there is a process to contest it you have to have a survey done and you have to prove yourself out you have to prove that the structure is above the, the hundred year floodplain so, you know, it's costly and it's tedious, but there, there is an opportunity for folks to do it. And, you know, it does happen because some of our lots are big enough where the house is actually at a different elevation. So um, more will be revealed, but I think the most important thing is Ryan's emphasis on getting the word out and letting people know that what's happening and that we want to help them as much as we can because 
it, it's, it is a pocketbook uh, issue. It's expensive. Okay. Well, it certainly is, and <clears throat> living myself adjacent to a creek, um, I mean, a, a lot of these houses have been built decades and decades ago, as mine has, and, um, you know, where the creek floods has been taken into consideration, you know, that, yes, the, the creek floods under my property, but I know that the water doesn't come into the house. Um, so the term for what you need to get in that case is a certificate of elevation, and it's done by a certain type of surveyor. And um, basically they shoot um, uh, survey marks from known flood high water marks and determine where that is in relation to the front door of the house and other things like that. And um, that is a tedious and long process. I know uh, uh, I've talked to my insurance company and gotten you know a break on rates for a couple of years until I can get it together to, to get the actual certificate of elevation. Uh, and it's not easy to get. I mean, you need to, um, you know, it's probably worth a number of neighbors getting together and hiring a surveyor to do a number of properties at once and then you get the you know the uh, you know a mass discount package or something like that because they're out there shooting marks for one house they could do another one without as much uh, work so it really behooves people to pay attention and talk to each other and find out what they've got to do to protect themselves any other comments from council on this report any comments from the public Seeing none, I will close public comment and we will move on. Uh, we have discussion number item number 13, discussion and consideration of the option of resolution 1252, resolution of the town council of town of Fairfax, establishing a protocol for the placement of items on the council agenda. Uh, Judy. Hi, well, I won't bore you reading the report, but we've done, um, we have some unwritten rules about how it works, putting something on the agenda and the mayor approves the agenda and we have an understanding that any council member can put something on the agenda. <clears throat> and in discussions with council member Weinsoff, um, it seems appropriate to set a standard or a protocol for how to do this. So if something goes on the agenda, this would formalize it to say that that would be accompanied by a report. This would, um, and this would let the public know what's going to be talked about and decided and it would give more transparency to the business that we're doing and um, as far as how this gets done Ryan mentioned he was on vacation I'm familiar with the topic it wasn't very difficult for me to do a report the staff is available to help council members with issues and doing the actual report and um, I think this is very doable and recommend that you consider adopting this resolution to formalize it. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from council? I think this is, oh, excuse me. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> I think this is a great idea. Um, just giving a little background on what's gonna be talked about. If you have any questions, it's easy to go ask your questions and do some homework before you get here. Uh, no brainer. Great, any other ones? And also for members of the public, I mean, they, there have been some pretty simple things on the agenda in the past, which basically the title of what the question is is pretty descriptive of what it's about. Um, but I guess this gives more info than that. Larry. Um, we actually have an ordinance that addresses this to some extent. Um, ordinance uh, 2.0. 8.090, which um, I actually drafted back in 2008. And um, I've put a lot of agenda items on, on the agenda over the years. And um, I usually draft them and type them myself. I don't rely on staff to do that. And um, I don't necessarily think it's a great idea to put the responsibility on staff to type council reports. Staff's got more to do, we're an independent body to some extent, and I think we should be responsible for our own work. So the aspect of the resolution I have a problem with is that uh, where it says town staff will prepare the text of all memoranda in a standardized format approved by the town clerk. 
you know, I mean, they got, there's enough for them to do. And I mean, I do think the public deserves written explanation of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, but no, I don't think that uh, it needs to be filtered by staff. Um, I think we, sh you know, if we put our name on something, it should come from us. I don't think it should uh, be deracinated by going through official town, you know, processes. So I, I disagree with it. And uh, in that respect, I, I do think, you know, having the respect of putting, you know, your proposal in writing is, is worthwhile. I do agree with that. Is there language that you would recommend to change for that? Um, me, since I wrote this, let me address this. First of all, the thing that you, I think, are referring to, I read over that section, and I was here for that. Um, that was a, a about council action with, if I'm correct, was about council action about things that were, you know, not of specific town um, resonance, in other words, issues that are foreign policy and things like that. I want to rehash all of that. But if I'm remembering the section correctly, and I did go back in to see uh, council powers and council, it's the end of that section. And, and that was specifically written to address those sorts of circumstances when they would be placed on the agenda and things like that. Um, I, I, can, I can see what you're saying here. It, this was not designed to have council filter um, our memoranda. It was, in a sense, to create a standardized format in which to present the material um, only. So I, what I was hoping is Judy staff would uh, say, hey, going forward in the future, and I think when you looked at this agenda and filtering through it, um, there really is a style in which um, all of our stuff could be placed on the agenda. Um, oddly enough, the ones that I wrote that Judy just inserted um, don't fall into that style, but I really like the way that the town staff style is very direct and, and cogent and would give a historical um, importance if people look back on this in, in a few years, as I certainly think they would. Um, so where that last, that fourth whereas really is not about the staff taking our material and massaging it. It's more just putting it into the format if we ourselves um, do not do that. And of course, staff could simply uh, send us the template uh, into which we then insert our stuff, removing their, um, the burden uh, from them in the circumstance. Th that's fine, and I, and I appreciate it. I just would get rid of that. Uh, paragraph um, you know everybody's trying to get their work in you know we've got a deadline we've got to get our stuff in a week ahead of time and uh, you know I do think that the proponents of agenda items um, have the duty you know and the responsibility to, to to type their own memoranda and to format their own work and not to lay it on staff and I agree with you. So I would say, Judy, let's um, take out the last whereas, and I would say send to all existing, and let's make a note uh, to all future council members, when you give them a little um, talk about their work coming up, here's the format when you, and they probably appreciate it, um, here's the format. When you submit something, boom, put it right here. You know, great. You know, internal culture, I'm all for creating more work and more bureaucracy, um, no, I, I disagree with it. So if, if we can get rid of that, whereas, I'm good. All right, with that change, I'll move resolution 12-52. Let's, um, I have to officially ask for public comment, even though we're clearly not going to get any. Yeah. <laughs> and, then I, and then I close that. If there's no public. Um, <laughs> do I still have to ask when there's no public? Uh, go ahead, David. Um, with the, with the uh, no comment from the public, I would move resolution number 12-52. Second. Motion winds off, second Bragman. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries as modified. Uh, and our next is number 14, adoption of resolution 1243, resolution of town council, town of Fairfax, continuing implementation of all the requirements of the Brown Act uh, during the state of California's three-year suspension of state mandates as contained in AB 1464 and SB 
1-0-0-6. David, this one's yours too. Yeah, Judy, and I, Judy and I collaborated on this, and I might say I received a call today from the Marin Association of Realtors. I think there was a piece this morning in the IJ about this. Uh, the, as the state uh, nickel and dimes its way toward insolvency, um, it has decided that uh, these very important requirements are state mandates that they will no longer um, reimburse us for. This has happened in, in the past, but we go about our task with great fidelity and attention to the importance of the Brown Act. And, and here we have a situation that uh, calls for simply, the state can take its own path, um, but we will show uh, great attention to not just what the Brown Act says, but to the spirit of what the Brown Act uh, speaks to. Um, openness of government uh, is, is critical and is the hallmark of government in Fairfax. Um, so this uh, resolution 12-53 uh, implements and ensures the continuing implementation of the requirements of the act um, during this, at the moment, uh, three-year suspension of these select pr um, provisions of the Brown Act. And I would ask uh, in the spirit of uh, Fairfax government that we uh, adopt it after uh, public comment. Any comments from uh, council? I'll, I'll comment. Go ahead, John. Oh. You can still go. Um, okay, I mean, uh, the, what the state has done is basically said that they're not going to pay for certain sections of the Brown Act, and the fact of the matter is, is they haven't been paying now for a couple of years anyway, uh, and we're still complying with this Brown Act, um, and the a lot of the Brown Act still applies, and I think that you know, it's an important uh, open government thing, and this is what we're starting initializing tonight with the uh, um, broadcast of, or the televising of this. Um, yes, the Brown Act costs money, and, you know, you have to go through all these channels, but I, I, it, transparency in government is really important and really crucial, and uh, yes, I think it's a no-brainer that we need to reaffirm that, and I think probably well, I hope we will see this all over the state. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Larry? I just was going to ask Judy, have we ever gotten reimbursed from the state of California for our Brown Act compliance? Yes, we, we used to. Uh, I think it's probably been five years maybe since yeah. we've gotten reimbursement. Yes. We so, have claims in, uh, yeah. and, uh, but we haven't actually received any money for quite a while. But we did used to get them, yeah. Okay. I'm sure those will be rolling in so anytime we, we, now. So we've, we've been complying. As, as best we can for the last five years, haven't we? Oh, we do this. Yeah, we do the same. We, yeah. Yeah, it hasn't changed yeah. what we do, yeah. but we haven't been paid for it. Yeah. I, I mean, think it's a good idea for us to make it official and just say we're going to continue to do that. Well, and I think a lot of cities are doing that to yeah. make it clear that yeah. they are continuing. Yeah. So. And I, I really appreciate uh, your uh, efforts and uh, vigilance in that regard. Mm -hmm. It's it's really uh, reassuring for me and you know, I'm on the inside looking out. So for the public, I mean, it's very good that we're reaffirming this tonight. I agree. Any other comment? Anything from the public? Seeing none. I'll move resolution 12-53. Uh, motion winds off. Second. Second, O'Neill. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you very much. That's a good one. Uh, item number 15, discussion and consideration and of enacting an ordinance to give the town of Fairfax further tools to abate fire danger from unmaintained bank-owned properties. John, this one's yours. Yeah, and it's, um, it is mine. It's, it's uh, you know, I've got a uh, report here that details, it uses one example property in Fairfax. Um, it's not the only bank-owned property in Fairfax, but it, the occupants of this property, 84 Pine, have not lived there for four or five years, something like that. Um, they, uh, you know, received a, um, a notice from the bank that they were able to pay their mortgage and the bank took over the property. And our fire chief has been working to ask the bank to abate the huge fire danger that this property causes to its neighbors. It's at the bottom of a very hot and very dry hill. There's a lot of um, properties above it on the slope. Uh, it has scotch broom that's 15 feet high or more. It's covered all over the place with lots of dry plants that have, you know, been, you know, 
basically it's a tinderbox waiting to go up. And um, <clears throat> currently, uh, I mean, I think the chief has, has been having a lot of problems even establishing that the bank actually owns it. I think it's a difficult process to go through. Um, the there's been a number of um, cities in California that have put extra uh, things in uh, ordinances in that give more powers. Uh, recently, in the news, uh, the city of Oakland and the city of Richmond were also doing that. They have, uh, you know, their uh, foreclosed properties are um, even more. They get used as dumping grounds or you know, places for drugs or prostitution to happen. Fortunately, we don't have problems quite on that scale. However, fire and danger is perhaps even a larger threat to life and property. Um, and it's not to be disregarded. Um, what the Oakland ordinance, for example, does is that it um, establishes an earlier point at which time a bank is responsible to abate that and finds them, you know, a lot of money per day. I think it's a thousand bucks. Um, I forget exactly what Oakland's is, but a thousand is a typical uh, amount. And what do you know? They go in and then they abate the uh, problems in these properties. Um, there have been complaints from banks. They say, well, you can't prove that we own it and you have to jump through all these legal hoops to get there. Um, and you know, you know, then it ends up in the courts. And I think uh, um, Councilman Bragman was referring to you know when it gets into the courts, then there's a whole legal proceedings, uh, you know, and you kind of look for a little crease in the law that allows them to get away with something that um, threatens their bottom line. But really, when their bottom line is threatening our communities, I think that we need to do something. Um, and I guess I put this on here for discussion among us uh, uh, as a council and also um, I'm appreciative that uh, David Weinsoff has communicated with, you know, being on the legislative committee has communicated with um, the um, League of Cities um, to find out what other cities have done and then also in our packet there is a, a letter back there detailing some of that. They don't take a position on it but they uh, coordinate communication between or, or they, they gave us a list of other cities that have taken action. Um, and basically I want to put it out there to see whether there is support on the council for following this further. Yes. <laughs> yes, from David. Uh, Ryan? I would like to hear from um, the fire department um, a couple of things. One is enforcement. Uh, you know, how, how, how is this going to be enforced? Is it something we're passing on paper or is there something more to it that we're going to be able to actually back up? Um, two, is it possible to do the work and place a lien on the property? Um, I don't know if that's legal to do. Jim? So yeah, and let's, I talked, let's, to, let's I talked to the chief today too, but I'm sure Jim will say the same thing. In our ordinance, we already have the ability to um, declare the fire department does to declare it a public nuisance without court action being required. It's not quite like our abatement process. They're, they're part of the ordinance says that they have to diligently pursue the owner, and I think that can be time consuming and, and problematic. But Jim, you probably have more information on this particular situation. Um, I'm, whoa, that, that thing's pretty loud. Jim Hansen, I'm a battalion chief for the Ross Valley Fire Department, serving the town of Fairfax. Why don't you try that other microphone? There you go. In the chief's absence, I'm prepared to answer any questions about uh, vegetation hazards near structures for abatement. And as a separate item, if you want any detailed information about that specific Pine Drive address. Um, so, the California Fire Code um, is commonly adopted by local uh, organizations. And the town of Fairfax, uh, on recommendation by the, by the fire department, uh, regularly adopts the changes in the, fire, in the fire code, in the California Fire Code. 
and this lies under the California uh, Fire Code Chapter 49 um, in terms of vegetation hazards around structures. The town of Fairfax has adopted that and in the town code, I think it's Title 8, and there's an, a specific section, 8.04.010, that is already on the books in the town of Fairfax that uh, applies for abatement um, of vegetation hazards around structures. Uh, um, because I have spoken to the chief in the past, and uh, I live adjacent to the, to the wall property, or as I like to refer to it as the breeding ground and home for all of the broom that you could ever imagine, not to mention dead oak and all sorts of things. And the, it's an absentee ownership. Uh, as John's pointing out, how come we haven't gone after the current owners of, of that property to say, hey, you got to clear this out? T tonight, I don't have specific information to answer specifically the, your question. Um, what, I, what I am prepared to share with you is that the abatement process for clearance of vegetation hazards around structures, as far as I'm aware of, we've never exercised that to the point in the code, in the Town of Fairfax code, where the uh, Ross Valley Fire Department board actually ultimately, th there's a specific process, there's a due process, and through this process, it's very time consuming, it's in, uh, um, you have to prove diligence in trying to locate the owner, et cetera, and ultimately ends up being a lien against the property, and uh, the fire board declares uh, that abatement is necessary, the fire chief is ordered to follow, pro, uh, start the abatement process, and the fire board, through this process, ultimately, this is just a, a, a short, capsulated version of it, uh, the fire board um, makes a uh, special assessment, and a, a, a registered letter gets sent to the assessor, and it gets a lien on the property, and in, once that is all in place, the cost of the fire department clearing the property gets assessed to the to the um, yeah. the property itself. But you're going. It's fascinating because you're going in a different direction than what I think John is going to. John is going toward a fining system in which the fines add up so voluminously over time. Let's say three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars a year. That even Bank X would have to sit up and take notice of. Uh, what's happening to their bottom line. In fact, it would eat up probably the value of the property. Um, and so they will get out and do um, the work rather than placing it upon our administrative bodies with its limited resources um, to do it. So it, it, it's, an, it's an, I think, it's an inverse process of exactly what John's talking about. Rather than why should we be burdened with the task of your bank's negligence in this important matter? Why should we be burdened with that? You should do the work. You should, you're the, you own the property. You should be the steward of the land and, and do what everybody else in Fairfax does with regard to proper maintenance, with regard to fire. Um, what I, how I would respond to that tonight, uh, given the time that I have in 27 years here, um, that's a great topic for the fire chief at a fire board meeting. It would be an excellent agenda item. And um, what I can tell you is this, this address on Pine Drive popped up on our radar uh, during our annual inspections last summer. And it actually ended up on my desk in August. And at that time, I was able to establish that def uh, Bank of America, the whole moral of this little story is that the first issue we're having right now immediately is finding out who has ownership of the property. I don't have the expertise in I th to, to, to give you that answer or, or navigate that, but what I can tell you is last year, personally, myself, I went to uh, Bradley Real Estate, who handled the sale of that property last time it was sold, exhausted all resources there, went to a local um, real estate agent who is well known in the county that handles foreclosures. He informed me that the only way uh, once the banks have ownership, they assign it to a foreclosure agent to move the property, and then that's the person that you can go to. The B of A, through our process, um, there's reference to a ticket number in the, in the staff report. Uh, there's been apparently multiple ticket numbers issued by 
our inquiry last year and again our inquiry in, uh, last month. Um, and it's a big, it appears to be a big quagmire right now. I don't have the exact answer tonight on how to navigate that, but I think it's a great agenda item for the fire board and the fire chief. And it's going to be, from my experience here, I think it's going to be more of a learning process with all everybody together as we navigate this. But one thing I just want to know, uh, just make real clear, Chapter 49 that in the California Fire Code that was adopted by the town of Fairfax, which is now your Title Eight is just specific to vegetation hazards around structures. It doesn't address the blight issues that the SF gate uh, printouts in the staff report refer to. Um, so in terms of the fire department's reference, you have something on the books. There is an abatement process. It's handled at the board level with the fire chief. Um, and the fire chief's intent is to go ahead and follow this through according to this property complaint, according to the a title eight in the in the town code, um, but do it uh, step in step with the fire board members as well. Yeah. Uh, since John and I uh, both have a Jones on for this issue, and by happenstance happen to both sit on the fire board, if uh, you'd be so kind as to express to Joanne uh, to uh, agendaize this uh, for the uh, for the next meeting in the next month or so, uh, I think John and I would greatly appreciate it. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take care of that for you. Yeah, and I mean, I think my sense is too that, you know, that sounds like a cumbersome process. And if there's a way that we can, you know, have an ordinance that's either done through the fire or done through the individual communities um, to make that process less cumbersome, that would be ideal, I think, for everyone involved. Right. And I think Jim has a. Um, my understanding of the o Oakland and the Richmond ordinances is they go beyond just fire dangers, it's the broader uh, topic of blight. So what you may want to do, in addition to working with the fire board, is get copies of those ordinances and have them at your next meeting and, and see how they work. Sounds like a great idea. Just, there you um, in, we've, my brothers and I inherited uh, some property in Wisconsin, and the city sends us a letter saying, either you cut down the weeds or we're going to do it and charge you. So I don't know if we have a weed abatement ordinance here um, but something like French broom uh, or Scotch broom, you know, has so clearly been identified as an invasive, you know, vegetation. It would, it, I mean, I want to look into the whole blight thing because it's a much bigger issue. But for this immediate situation on, on pine, um, we might we look into just a weed, simple weed abatement ordinance where we can just send a notice to the last known address of the owner and say, hey, you know, either you take care of it or we're going to take care of it. And, you know, we put a lien on the property and, you know. Cool. Currently, right now, that's your Title Eight, And, and, and the, the first step is deeming that situation a public nuisance. Yeah, and the, the process I'm familiar with, they don't go through that whole public nuisance thing. I mean, it's just they have an ordinance. If your weeds are too high, right. if you don't cut them, we're cutting them, yeah. and you can and pay us. That's It might be specific to the state of Wisconsin because what you've adopted here is the state of California. Yeah, but I'm just saying yeah. maybe outside the fire code, you know, we could just do like a vegetation abatement ordinance, a simple vegetation abatement ordinance. Well, and that's a point that you can bring up at the uh, fire board to represent the Fairfax Council. So it, it may be a little simpler yeah, to make right. that determination. Yeah. O Oakland does the same thing. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I've known that exactly those letters going out in the city of Oakland. So, yeah. It's worth so, it. I mean, maybe, you know, just to address the situation on, on Pine. And then quicker. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, you know, just, and I don't want to take a lot of time, I do think it's worth looking into that whole thing because, you know, um, that neighborhood did have a, house not where prostitution was occurring but there was definitely like drug activity and you know some somewhat uh, unsavory um, activity going on and it became a big problem so we're, we are not immune from that we have our own little variant of it you know but you know relative to our standards of living here it's you know a problem that I think we need to address so I you know, appreciate you bringing it to us. Good. Me too. 
All right, I think you know how to proceed. Our final item, number 16, discussion of the status of cable casting, web streaming of council meetings. So that's, that speaks for itself and uh, really maybe should get put over to the next meeting because that'll actually be publicly broadcast meeting. So this, all this equipment was paid for by the Marin Telecommunications Agency. So, um, you know, and the other thing that we're doing with with the um, crew, the staff, is we're supporting the community media center. So it's a, it's a good thing, it's a great institution we're supporting, and I do think we're gonna create like a little First Amendment uh, sanctuary in here. And I think there's gonna be, beyond council meetings, there'll be other public meetings that will be broadcast out of this facility. So it's, it's I think, a really good thing for Fairfax to have this uh, equipment in here. Well done. It's nice to see it come into fruition. Yeah. All right, let me ask for a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Uh, motion O'Neill, second. second. Read. All in favor say aye. Aye, aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you all very much.